his mammoth work that is usually called just the city of God, St. Augustine always has a number of ideas in play simultaneously. But among the most important of those ideas is the way in which he tries to do what we might call desacralize or demythologize our understanding of the realm of politics. And that makes Augustine actually a little bit different in some ways from some uh, uh, other elements in the Catholic tradition that uh, followed him and that were less inclined to uh, demythologize the political realm in the way he does. The historian Peter Brown, who's the author of a wonderful uh, biography of Augustine, calls attention to the way in which Augustine begins Book 19 of the City of God. Book 19, I mean, the City of God is this huge book. Some of it is really only of antiquarian interest. You'd have to have You'd have to uh, you know, be interested in ancient Roman religion or something like that to read parts of it. But book 19 is still widely read, uh, read by political theorists, for instance, and so forth. Um, and, and at the start of that book, Augustine uh, draws on the thought of this uh, Roman thinker whom he was uh, fairly fond of, Marcus Vero. And he, he outlines Vero's 288 theories of the good life. Vero had this scheme um, uh, that he put together, and uh, there were 288 possible theories of the good life. And Augustine briefly uh, outlines uh, this, and then proceeds to reject all 288 of them as inadequate on one ground or another. And Peter Brown writes, this marks the end of classical thought. And what Brown meant by that is it marks the end of the notion that politics could provide the good life for human beings. Um, uh, for Augustine, no political community is the place where human beings can be perfected in virtue. Uh, no political community can satisfy the restless heart that Augustine evokes so, uh, uh, so wonderfully in his confessions. And so in a certain sense, Augustine, Augustine is trying to sort of drain the notion of high moral purpose from, uh, from our understanding of politics, to get rid of any hint of ultimacy in it. Uh, Politics is not redemptive in any sense. The best we can hope for, Augustine thinks, is earthly peace, which is no small thing. Uh, indeed, uh, if you lived in Augustine's world, uh, you would uh, agree with that. And Augustine says in Book 19 that peace falls very sweetly on the human ear. So it's a great good, but it, there's no ultimacy uh, to it. And one might ask or worry, ask whether or worry about this um, uh, whether it demonstrates a kind of lack of concern for justice, which is the sort of the cardinal political good. I don't think it really does. It simply means that within human history for Augustine, on his view, the actual communities that we inhabit are always caught in a field of force between the two cities, uh, what he calls the city of God, uh, in which peace truly reigns, and what he calls the earthly city, in which he says men are dominated by the lust for domination. And what this means for, this, for the actual communities that we inhabit is that even if um, uh, they do fairly well, every peace that we fashion is going to be to some degree an unjust peace, as far as Augustine is concerned. Um, and the, uh, 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 that will be the best we can manage. We, we must use force to seek justice, and we must let our force be limited by justice, and that will be uh, the world in which, uh, in which we live. That's the best we can manage. And so Augustine has a very famous depiction in Book 19 of what he calls the philosopher judge, who, uh, who might rather do some other things, but accepts the need to, uh, to act in public life, to, uh, to carry out public responsibilities, is willing to use uh, force in order to accomplish that when, uh, when need be, uh, to try to achieve an earthly peace. And um, Augustine, asked, Augustine, recognizing that uh, it would be good for such a person to do this, says, but still, you wouldn't call it the happy life, would you? You wouldn't call it the good life for a human being. And he says, how much more mature reflection it shows, how much more worthy of a human being it is when a man acknowledges this necessity as a mark of human wretchedness, when he hates that necessity in his own actions, and when, if he has the wisdom of devotion, he cries out to God, deliver me from my necessities. And that's the way Augustine sees um, uh, our life here. And so it's against that Augustinian background. I'm not gonna talk about Augustine, uh, for the most part tonight, <clears throat> but it's against that background that I want to think with you about the, uh, the use of force in political life. I'm going to draw on several classical sources to do this, moving very quickly uh, 
very far away from any area in which I might have any claim to expertise. Um, so uh, so uh, the, the texts that I'm going to primarily deal with are not ones that I claim to be uh, expert in. And although I will begin from a very particular issue about the way the United States uses force, I'm for the most part going to range very far afield from that as well. I don't want to think about, I'm not going to think so much about particular issues uh, in, uh, in the use of force or warfare as just about what it means that we live in a world in which uh, it's a necessity, that we find ourselves caught in that world. And uh, I will be focusing primarily on the use of force in warfare, but Augustine never forgot that uh, even if force is never used, political community relies on the implied threat to use it. So it's not even it, uh, a matter of it being used, but that it always underlies political community, or so uh, he thought. I hope that by the time uh, we're done, you will not think this has uh, been time badly spent, though there are, in the nature of the case, very few guarantees uh, of that. Um, uh, and I, I, and I, I will ultimately make my way back to this Augustinian vision from which I start, though it's, gonna, it's going to be a long and circuitous path uh, to get there. Let me begin by reading you a, a statement that's kind of a programmatic statement. Today, the United States enjoys a position of unparalleled military strength and great economic and political influence. In keeping with our heritage and principles, we do not use our strength to press for unilateral advantage. We seek instead to create a balance of power that favors human freedom. That, that is a programmatic statement that came very near the beginning of what uh, is called the National Military Strategy that was announced by the White House in September of 2002. Uh, and I realize you're fairly young, many of you, but that you know was about a year after the uh, uh, terrorist attack, which you do remember, uh, I, I think. Anyway, this 2002 uh, document, which uh, remains important, even though it's technically superseded by a later version of the National Military Strategy, uh, in addition to that programmatic statement that I just read to you, also asserted a commitment to military forces to having military forces described in this way. Strong enough to dissuade potential adversaries from pursuing a military buildup in hopes of surpassing or equaling the power of the United States. A goal that may rest a little uneasily beside the renunciation of unilateral advantage that the programmatic statement um, uh, said. Not quite clear how one would hold those two together. Now, the United States is at present the uh, world's most powerful nation and the country most able to wage something that we might call total war if, uh, 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 if we wanted to. The United States would also like to think of itself as simultaneously the country least likely actually to do that. And I actually think there is something to that self-assessment, though uh, it would not be hard to uh, to meet it with a certain amount of cynicism, since, after all, when it was the only nation capable of waging atomic war, the United States did just that, and the president who made the final call is supposed to have said that he never lost a night's sleep over the decision. So whatever the uh, inconsistencies uh, that may be present in our national military strategy or in our national character, it's good that a nation as powerful as ours is a nation that is now even thought of as sometimes as imperial, as you know, uh, having an empire, it's good that such, an, such a nation should regularly rethink uh, the, length, the lengths to which it is prepared to go in pursuit of its aims, uh, because those strategic aims should both seek justice and be limited by justice. In, in some way, uh, both of those things have to be true. Uh, at a time when, in the years after the end of the Cold War, some thought that we had moved into a new world order. Uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History, um, uh, which was not nearly as simple-minded as some people made it seem. Uh, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't be a Hegel scholar and uh, really write something simple-minded. But um, at, at a time when some thought that was the case and thought that questions other than military strategy would come to dominate our attention in the future, all sorts of events conspired, including that uh, September uh, 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 2001 uh, attack, but events in, uh, in the Middle East and in Asia and elsewhere that have actually produced just the opposite kind of world. And from many angles, we seem to be grasping for new clarity in uh, our understanding of, 
uh, the right use of force. There are all sorts of particular issues that arise along the way, um, uh, whether preemptive strikes would be morally permissible in a terrorist age when attack comes with a little warning from quarters that are in some respect private rather than public, um, uh, whether there are uh, uh, whether the, the uh, advances in our weapons technology have outpaced our ability to figure out how to, uh, how to use them. Um, but our deepest problems, I think, come not from uh, the weapons themselves, not from our technological genius, but simply from the moral realities of war and of human character, which may not be so different today from what they have always been. Herbert Butterfield, who was a great English historian, uh, now dead, um, among other things, wrote a little book on warfare. And in that book, he, he wrote once that if you, uh, if you take the animosity that is present in the average church choir and you give it a history by spreading it out over time, you have an adequate explanation for all the wars ever fought in human history. Um, <laughs> now, whatever the truth of that uh, what may, may be, um, it, it, there, it's worth paying attention to the dangers that the, uh, that the use of force, even the absolutely necessary use of force, you know, in terms of Augustine's uh, necessity language, the, the, the nece even the necessary use of force may still pose great dangers for those who use it. And that's really the problem that I want to think about with you. There was a time when the uh, tools of war were not the kinds of... Uh, remarkable weapons that uh, we have now developed, but we're just a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. And yet some of our culture's most profound reflections on the meaning of war and the use of force come from that time. And in a fascinating essay, which I'm going to try to trace out with you, um, and which some of you may have read, uh, Simone Weil, that sort of, that sort of tormented um, uh, French woman, mid 20th century. Uh, Simone Weil describes the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, as what she calls the poem of force. And she considers what the poem has to teach us about the effects of force, both on those who are conquered by it and on those who do the conquering uh, with it. And I want to rehearse some aspects of her analysis in order to think about this, even if I am uh, ranging pretty far from contemporary concerns and pretty far, as I said, from any text on which I claim any sort of expertise. There are a couple texts in the world on which I would do that, but I'm not going to be talking about uh, them. Force, uh, uh, they write, force turns anybody who is subjected to it into a thing, into a natural object. The extreme example of this comes when force produces a corpse, a body that has become a thing, a body when the breath of life, the soul, the anima is no longer in it. And uh, that's bad. That's no doubt terrible. But for they, it is not the most terrible thing. Worse almost than a corpse is what she calls a living thing. Those who are, who are on the receiving end of force can be turned into things can be thingified even before they are dead, before they become corpses. They're at the mercy of their, uh, their conqueror. And so she says, an extraordinary entity, this, a thing that has a soul. And Homer gives us images of that. People at whose heart the sword is pointed, uh, on their knees, begging for life, entirely at the disposal of their enemy. And she notes, they notes what existentialists such as Sartre once emphasized, that anyone who is near us exercises a certain power over us by his very presence. And there is often in human interaction, even in ordinary human interaction, a sort of endlessly shifting battle between two subjects with the presence of each threatening or sometimes attempting to objectify the other. But that process of objectification comes to full term at the point of a sword. And she, uh, she quotes a famous passage from uh, the Iliad. Thus spoke the brilliant son of Priam, Hector. Thus spoke the brilliant son of Priam in begging words. Dropping his spear, he knelt down, holding out his arms. Achilles, drawing his sharp sword, struck through the neck and breastbone. The two-edged sword sunk home its full length. The other, face down, lay still, and the black blood ran out, wetting the ground. He'd become a thing, become an object but he actually became that before he died, um, when he was on his knees uh, begging before the, uh, the one using force. <laughs> this does not mean, I think, I mean, 
you may disagree, but this does not mean that force should never be used, nor does it mean that force does not often serve the cause of justice. Uh, and Ave, and I think, does not, uh, does not mean that. She was an avid a supporter of the Free French Forces uh, after France was occupied by Germany. But her anguished and, to some degree, sort of extreme sensibility does help us to see the price that force exacts from us. It is a price paid first and most obviously by those on whom it is used, on the conquered. And they pay this price not only if they die, but also perhaps even more acutely when they do not. And there are certainly places in the world where scores of people are experiencing precisely that, uh, precisely that today. That much, might, that much, however, the sense in which the one on whom force is used is, is thingified, turned into an object, that might, I think, be evident to us even if we, we lacked Vey's poet, poetic attentiveness to the Iliad. What might be less evident to us, however, is the effect force has not on the conquered, but on the conqueror, not on those against whom it's used, but on those who wield it. And at least in her view, the effect paradoxically, is really precisely the same. They, too, become things, natural objects. For, she writes, is as pitiless to the man who possesses it or thinks he does as to its victims. The second, that is the victims, the second it crushes, the first, the ones who use it, it intoxicates. And she depicts this intoxicating power in a number of ways. And I want to just sort of through a, a few of them through because it's instructive to think about the ways in which, the different ways in which force enslaves the man who uses it, not just the one who's on the, uh, uh, the receiving end of it. Just as the one at whom the sword is pointed is transformed into a thing, into inert matter, so also the one whose hand is on the sword. Um, this person, uh, uh, may become, uh, they actually tends to say will become, but I think we need to be a little more careful and say may become uh, pure momentum, blind force, uh, also a thing, therefore, rather than an ensouled human being. And the soldier, even the victorious, the conquering soldier, faces death in every moment and has at his disposal the life or death of others. And that's a very she thinks intoxicating experience. Um, and so she writes a, a line in it, uh, in the essay that is, uh, uh, that I love, uh, for, for the one using force uh, and who faces death at every moment, every morning the soul castrates itself of aspiration, every day, um, uh, give up aspiration, losing all conceptions of purpose or goal, even the sort of the aims of what the war is. Now, I'm going to take time a little later to, to sort of qualify her claims because I say I think she can overstate them. But if we're not just to place our faith in force, we need to absorb some of the power of her vision. Anyone using force who becomes pure momentum or is in danger of becoming pure momentum may find it hard to know wh sort of what limits to respect or when to stop. Even the human countenance, the face of the enemy, may not suffice. It's hard to respect life in another when you've had to castrate yourself of all yearning for it every day. So that the other sets no identifiable limit to our projects. The presence of the other person has no uh, uh, effect on us when that other person has become object rather than subject. Or as she says, other people no longer impose on us that interval of hesitation a kind of pause that forces us to reflect. Um, uh, that's what truly human presence should require of us. Most of all, they notes that users of force, having themselves become pure momentum, count on it too much. They have no suspicion, she writes, they have no suspicion of the fact that the consequences of their deeds will at length come home to them. They too will bow the neck in their turn. Users of force wanting everything, forget one little detail, that everything is never within their power. She reminds us that at the end of the first day's combat in the Iliad, the Greek forces might almost be thought to have achieved their war aim. They are on the verge of being able to take Helen back, and that to bring Helen of Troy back was what supposedly uh, they were after. But by that evening, the, the fighting has been so successful that the Greeks are no longer interested just in bringing Helen back. It now seems that Troy itself 
is within their grasp on the very brink of capture and destruction, and that now becomes their goal. What they want, she says, is in fact everything. But in the Iliad, success is always momentary. What sometimes baffles or I think actually maybe even bores us a little bit as readers of the poem. I don't know how many of you uh, have, uh, have read the Iliad. But what, 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 what sometimes baffles us, I'm not sure what that signified. Um, probably better not to ask. But if you've not read it, my, this is my standard line, if you've not read it, uh, you will, of course, you'd be too proud to accept the BA prior to uh, reading it. You'll certainly want to do that before you accept your degree from Biola. But um, uh, what, what is sort of baffling, and, and I think, uh, honestly, um, can get a little boring for readers, is the way the fortunes of the war seem to swing back and forth from day to day. I mean, one, one moment, um, uh, uh, Troy is almost captured. The next moment, the Greeks are pushed back to the ships. You know, um, uh, that's the way uh, uh, each, each day, as, ho as what Homer calls rosy-fingered dawn comes, you know, uh, the, 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 the thing shifts uh, again, suggesting to they, at any rate, what she thinks is the deepest truth of the use of force, that victory is always transitory. It, it doesn't last. Um, that even even seeming victors have their uh, uh, have their force only on loan from fate, and she says all finally share the same fate. Ares is just, and kills those who kill. So the world of the Iliad, at least on her reading, is not really divided between conquerors and conquered, between those who possess force and those who are possessed by it. The truth is nobody really possesses it in the poem. That's, the, that's the, the teaching of the poem. Now, I suggested earlier that I think these claims need a little qualification. Um, if, you, if you know anything about Simone Weil, I mean, hers really is an anguished uh, and extreme sensibility, though fascinating uh, woman. Uh, but she provides herself a little bit of, of the, the nuance. Uh, she acknowledges, in fact, there are just little places along the way where, for instance, she acknowledges that what she calls a moderate use of force may be possible for those who've taken up the sword, but then she'll immediately go on to say that this will require a superhuman virtue which is as rare as dignity in weakness. She, she calls attention to some what she calls luminous moments in the poem in which man possesses his soul. These are moments of courage and love. Uh, familial love, marital love, uh, love among friends, love among comrades in arms, and even the, uh, the sort of the purest triumph of love, uh, the crowning grace of war, which she calls the friendship that floods the hearts of mortal enemies. And she gives uh, uh, the famous example from the Iliad when aged Priam, uh, King Priam of Troy, comes as a suppliant to Achilles to beg for the body of Hector, his son. Achilles has been dragging it around uh, uh, the city, if you know the story. Um, and Homer uh, uh, says, but when thirst and hunger had been appeased, then Dardanium Priam fell to admiring Achilles. How tall he was and handsome. He had the face of a god. And in his turn, Dardanium Priam was admired by Achilles, who watched his handsome face and listened to his words. So she, she sees that in the poem, that those moments, she says, are rare moments of grace in what is more often a picture of uniform horror. And she writes, a soul which has entered the province of force will not escape this by a miracle, except by a miracle. Such miracles are rare and of brief duration. So that despite her, uh, you know, her acknowledgement of the possibility of escape, these, um, uh, these uh, rare moments of superhuman virtue for her are uh, so uh, uh, scarce as to be almost negligible. But I think that um, uh, there may be a little more to be said for these possibilities than she allows. I suspect that these moments are less rare than they suppose, is that in a certain sense, she does not do justice to the justice of soldiers. Um, in, his, in his famous book on warfare, wonderful book on warfare, Just and Unjust Wars, the political theorist Michael Walzer has a short discussion of what he calls naked soldiers. And these are uh, a discussion of instances that he has culled from war memoirs in which repeatedly a soldier who is on patrol or a soldier who is on sniper duty uh, uh, catches an enemy soldier unaware sees him drinking his coffee in the morning on the, you know, the lines on the uh, other side, uh, something like that, and uh, holds him in his gun sight, 
easy to kill and has to decide whether to shoot him or let the opportunity pass. <clears throat> These are people who every morning castrate themselves of uh, you know, their aspirations uh, and their goals. And yet, uh, Walzer collects these instances in which, uh, on many occasions, these soldiers caught in that field uh, of force nevertheless turn out to be unwilling to shoot. Sometimes for reasons they articulate very clearly, other, other times for reasons that they don't even quite understand, and yet, uh, uh, yet that's true. So that even though the enemy soldier, being a soldier, is always a legitimate target, uh, as it violates no law of war if they're shot under those circumstances, in such unguarded moments that, that just the human face of the enemy is almost impossible to overlook. It imposes a certain kind of interval of hesitation um, in these various instances from real wars that Walzer has, uh, ha has drawn out. And that suggests, at least to me, that something a little less than superhuman virtue may sometimes suffice uh, to set limits on what we do uh, in war. It doesn't mean that Vey hasn't seen something really important, but that um, there's more to be said than just that. But in any case, from the fact that all share the same fate, from the fact that victory is transitory and, and fleeting, from the fact that uh, conquered and conquerors and conquered face that same ultimate danger of being thingified, they does not conclude, as I said before, she does not conclude that force should never be used. Um, rather, she draws a conclusion that actually lies at the heart of uh, the received tradition of just war thinking about warfare. Um, from her analysis of the world of force, or from the way she draws it out from Homer, springs, she writes, springs the idea of a destiny before which executioner and victim stand equally innocent, before which conquered and conqueror are brothers in the same distress. So that there's kind of equality uh, that she finds forged there between um, uh, soldiers on opposing sides. <coughs> and she calls attention to what she regards as um, uh, the extraordinary, what she calls the extraordinary sense of equity that, one, that sort of just breathes through the poem. And she says, one is barely aware that the poet is a Greek and not a Trojan. Um, but there's a kind of uh, uh, equality uh, there. So the point is not that war must never be waged. On the contrary, it may be necessary to use force sometimes. Say that uh, we should never use it and at least in those Augustinian terms with, with which I began, we relinquish too readily the claims uh, of justice in human life. Nor is the point that war, I mean, you might be tempted to conclude, but I think you should not. Uh, uh, the point is not that war, even necessary war, must always be waged with a bad conscience. Uh, you know, that um, because it is a necessity from which we'd like to be delivered, um, we, should, uh, we should do it with a bad conscience. If we find ourselves in circumstances in which using force is really the right thing to do, then it's the right thing to do, and we should do it with a good conscience. But what justice requires, and what may be done with a good conscience, may also be dangerous. Not simply in the obvious sense uh, that, you know, somebody might get harmed or killed, but dangerous to our character as creatures, uh, dangerous to who we are. We must, we must somehow retain a sense of limits, honor the face of the human enemy, uh, uh, respect that interval of hesitation that the face of the other uh, places upon us, so that taking the, uh, the measure of the domain of force and respecting its power means knowing that not everything is within our power. And we somehow have to retain that sense if we are to um, uh, respect any limits along the way because she thought that the Iliad was unsurpassed in depicting this truth about the human condition, the truth about what force is and does to us. In her essay, Vey describes the Iliad as the only true epic the West possesses. The only true epic the West possesses. Maybe you read the Odyssey too, but um, doesn't qualify, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't measure up to this. Um, but in particular, and of interest for my purposes here, she writes that the Romans had no epics, and could not, she says, because they saw their country as the nation chosen by destiny to be mistress of the world, and therefore they could never have conceived of a destiny before which executioner and victim stand equally innocent. Um, uh, they thought of themselves as destined for imperial rule, and so there could be no Roman epic. Now, again, I don't know what you've read, but you might ask yourself, no Roman epic? There is this uh, a long poem called the Aeneid uh, by, uh, by Virgil. Um, uh, what about that? Um, uh, I mean, Vey does not comment specifically on it. Her comment in, uh, uh, in the essay is simply that uh, 
that the Romans could not, uh, you know, could not conceive of themselves simply as uh, uh, kind of equals with those whom they were, uh, they were destined uh, to rule. But I want to turn briefly to the Aeneid. I told you I was going to deal with a number of texts on which I claim no expertise, and see, I'm proving this just time and again uh, to you. Um, but I, I want to turn uh, briefly to it because it may enrich our reflection on the necessary but dangerous use of force to achieve necessary human aims. There can be no doubt, uh, of course, that a sense of destiny does pervade Virgil's epic. I mean, that's, that is clear. Its famous opening lines, um, uh, you know, the few lines that I managed to scan years ago, uh, but the, the, the famous opening lines sing of a man uh, who, uh, uh, of arms and a man who came to Italy by destiny till he could found a city. And this is not just any man, but this is, as he's always described, Pius Aeneas, Pius Aeneas. That's, his, that's Aeneas' great character, his, his pietas, um, uh, who knows himself as Robert Fitzgerald's translation uh, of, the, of the Aeneid puts it as, the man whom heaven call. So there is destiny there. I mean, and he's being called to found Rome, and Rome is, uh, uh, is to rule. Uh, the, uh, the, the Aeneid does not disguise the way in which force makes objects of the uh, conquered, and in certain respects also the conqueror. And, and the, the crucial passage for, and, the, and problem for understanding the nature of force in the Aeneid, a passage about which, at least as I understand it, scholarly debate is not likely to cease any time in the future, um, is the poems, comes in the poem's concluding lines, and I'm going to get to those in a moment. But in order to get to them, uh, we need to look at one earlier passage in, in Book 6 of the Aeneid, also a famous scene uh, in the Aeneid, where uh, Aeneas is journeying in the underworld, uh, those of you who've read it will remember it. Um, he finds his father Anchises, uh, who's now dead. And Anchises shows him the future, shows him the future greatness of Rome, uh, uh, the future greatness of this people whom Aeneas is destined to found. Um, and uh, Anchises says that other, other peoples may excel in art, argument, or astrology, but Roman greatness is going to lie elsewhere, in the arts of rule, in the use of force, but in the controlled use of force. And Anchises says, famous lines to Aeneid, says, but he's really speaking not just, he's speaking to, to future Rome. Uh, you know, he's the, the destiny of Rome. He says, Roman, remember by your strength to rule Earth's peoples, for your arts are to be these, to pacify, to impose the rule of law, to spare the conquered, battle down the proud. That, by the way, is a... Uh, a passage that in uh, Book One, Chapter Six, Book One, Chapter Six of Augustine's City of God, where Augustine is desacralizing uh, the political community um, and, in particular, uh, debunking uh, the claims of Roman glory, Augustine specifically uh, cites Anchises' words to Aeneas in a context to suggest that. Rome really never measured up uh, to uh, to that. Uh, at any rate, Anchises, I'll just read it to you again. <coughs> Anchises says. Roman, remember by your strength to rule Earth's peoples, for your arts are to be these, to pacify, to impose the rule of law, to spare the conquered, battle down the proud. Now think about that. So to spare the conquered, not as a, a rare moment of grace or a, a miracle or a superhuman virtue, but as a, a sort of natural possibility as the characteristic of a people in arms. And that, but that's the way it, uh, it should be. You might say, to ride the waves of the sea of force and not be ridden by them. That's the picture Anchises gives. So to control the power of uh, technique by the power of soul that one does not become pure momentum. That's what it means to be Roman. And perhaps especially, Virgil means, that's what it means to be Roman in the age of Augustus' empire. Uh, I mean, that's what he's writing for in, in imperial Rome. Now, with that background, the question is how we're to read the famous scene at the end of the poem. A scene, as I said, that, again, we're way, way beyond my expertise, but I think uh, scholars are never going to agree quite on how to take these. Um, but at the end of the poem, there's, uh, it, it seems that Aeneas might be governed less by pietas than by furor, fury. And uh, in this scene, it's the scene in which uh, Aeneas slays Turnus, who is the, the leader of the the, the, the defending Latins who are defending themselves against um, uh, the invading Trojans. And 
in this scene, in, in, in one sense we might say it looks as if we have a classic example of both conquered and conqueror becoming mere things. Inert matter on the one hand for the conquered, pure momentum on the other for the conqueror. Aeneas runs his sword through Turnus' thigh, bringing him to his knees. Virgil writes, the man brought down, brought low, lifted his eyes and held, held his right hand out to make his plea. You have defeated me. The Latins have seen me in defeat, spreading my hands. Lavinia is your bride, but go no further out of hatred. Aeneas pauses, experiencing in a way that interval of hesitation that they uh, talks about before the, uh, the, the humanity uh, even of the conquered enemy. Um, and that you might think about what a moment that pause is. It's a moment in which the, uh, the character of Roman Empire hangs in the balance. Aeneas, remember Anchises' words, Aeneas has battled down the proud. Will he now also remember, as Anchises had advised, to spare the conquered? That's exactly where we are at the end of the poem. Um, and having paused, having stayed his hand for a moment and, and hesitated, Aeneas suddenly noticed that, notices that Turnus is wearing the sword belt of uh, a young Trojan warrior, Pallas, whom he had killed in battle, Pallas whom Aeneas had loved greatly and for whom he had taken responsibility. He notices this. And so then <coughs> Virgil writes, Aeneas raged at the relic of his anguish worn by this man as trophy. Blazing up and terrible in his anger, he called out, you in your plunder, torn from one of mine, shall I be robbed of you? This wound will come from Pallas. Pallas makes this offering, and from your criminal blood exacts his due. He sank his blade in fury, furor. He sank his blade in fury in Turnus' chest, then all the body slackened in death's chill, and with a groan for that indignity, his spirit fled into the gloom below. And those are the last words of the poem. That's how it ends there. And you might say, what is the meaning of this ending of this great, greatest Roman epic? What is the meaning of this ending for the Rome of Virgil's day, for the empire of Augustus? And this is where, as I understand it, you know, um, the scholars will disagree. It can be read in different ways. Um, here's one way you could read it. You could say, Aeneas has fulfilled his destiny. Uh, perhaps we should even say that powers greater than Aeneas have uh, brought that to pass because really the gods and goddesses have been at work in all this all along uh, the way. Uh, and with Turnus out of the way, peace will now be possible. Native Latins and invading Trojans will learn to live together and will forge Roman greatness, a greatness founded in large measure on a rule of imperial law that does not hesitate to use force to bring uh, justice upon those who deserve it. And therein lies Aeneas' greatness, as one reading of the poem might have it. He does not shrink back from the world of force, but he puts it to good purpose. And, and that's a, a perfectly legitimate, maybe for, maybe for all I know, the right way to read the end of the poem. But you could still ask, if that's the way to read it, if that's the ending, does that sort of ending really display pietas, Roman greatness, as Anchises had described it to Aeneas? I think it must have been that question about the Aeneid, that must have been Simone Weil's question about the Aeneid. That, that had to be her, part of her reason for regarding it as inferior to the Iliad. It didn't capture that sense of just sort of shared equal, uh, equal fate. For in the end, um, even great Aeneas seems unable to exercise the kind of superhuman virtue that would enable him to possess and not be possessed by the use of force. In the end, he's governed more by fury than by piety. Virgil uses precisely uh, that word, even though it's been pious Aeneas all along. Uh, and the greatness that spares the conquered seems to exist only in Anchises' imagination, not in what uh, Aeneas actually does. So, um, uh, you know, that's one way to think about it. Um, but you can also take it, you can also uh, think of it this way. Um, Perhaps if that's the way you know, the poem ends, perhaps Virgil's epic does not aim only to magnify the greatness of Augustus' Rome, but to sound a certain note of caution or even warning. Um, 
And see, this is a different way to think about it. Uh, Anchises' vision is one possible Rome. So is the ending of the Aeneid. These are two possible Romes, for given precisely the opportunity to spare the suppliant Aeneas in a moment of blind momentum does just exactly the opposite. And you might read Virgil to say that from that picture of human possibilities and dangers, of these different possibilities, any ruler and any people should, should learn, and maybe especially for Virgil, Augustus uh, should learn in that age of empire. Learn what? Well, we have to be clear. Uh, uh, rulers should not learn entirely to avoid the use of force. For then, precisely as rulers, they do us no good. Uh, there's no reason to have them if they're unwilling to use force. Indeed, if I may for a moment turn from classical uh, to Christian thought, uh, John Calvin was not mistaken, I think, in the rather graphic idiom of an earlier age to suggest that the magistrate who refuses to bloody his sword dishonors God, as Calvin says. Um, uh, I mean, that's why we have uh, political rulers. But the lesson that we need to learn to, to draw from Vey's analysis is not, therefore, that the world of force is off limits, but that plumbed to its depths, um, uh, we have to learn that the limits and the dangers that power uh, involves. Force there will always be and must be. And yet only when the enemy is seen also and finally as one of us. Uh, perhaps even, to Mao put it in specifically Christian terms, one in whom we discern that Christ, who is the image of the eternal God. Only then could we hope for the virtue which, if not superhuman, is surely exacting enough, the virtue that keeps us from becoming things and thereby preserves our humanity. That places constraints on how we use force, and most of all, on, on who we are, on the kind of people we try to be. Now, finally, though when I say finally, <laughs> you should not suppose that 30 seconds from now, I will be done. Uh, <laughs> it will take a little longer. But finally, uh, not long ago, in the year 2005, a young American named Nathaniel Fick published a book titled One Bullet Away. Shortly after graduating from Dartmouth with a degree in classics, a degree in classics where I presume he read the Iliad and the <laughs> Aeneid, Fick enlisted in the Marine Corps, eventually becoming an officer of an elite reconnaissance battalion uh, uh, in combat in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Most of the book simply recounts his training and his uh, service. Indeed, its subtitle is The Making of a Marine Officer. And a lot of the book is about that. But the very sort of the last very short section of the book is titled simply Aftermath. Um, and in it, he explains why he decided not to remain in the Marines after his uh, tour of duty was up. Why, as he says, I knew I had to leave. It was not because of any disillusionment or cynicism. On the contrary, he writes that the intangible honor and pride of being a Marine officer outweighed all the adversity. So then why not continue? Uh, it was because even when he had returned to this country and was no longer in combat, he still found himself caught up, if I were to put it in Vey's terms, these are, this is not his terms, but found himself caught up in the pure momentum that the world of force involves. He writes, when a driver cut me off in a merge lane, I visualized without emotion pulling his head back and cutting his throat with my car key. And so he says, I left the Corps because I had become a reluctant warrior. A little like Augustine's philosopher judge. Um, I left the Corps because I had become a reluctant warrior. Many Marines reminded me of gladiators. And he doesn't say that bad, uh, critically. I mean. There are times when you'd be very glad to have a gladiator uh, at your side, okay? It's not a bad thing. Um, but many Marines reminded me of gladiators. They had that mysterious quality that allows some men to strap on greaves and a breastplate and wade into the gore. Surely he had read Homer and Virgil. Um, I, I respected, admired, and emulated them, but I could never be like them. I could kill when killing was called for, and I got hooked on the rush of combat as much as any man did, but I couldn't make the conscious choice to put myself in that position again and again. That is, he had to some extent at least the way I read it, taken the measure of the world of force and gained a new vantage point from which to contemplate it and to know its limits. Um, 
the short, this short aftermath of Fick's book has an epigraph, an epigraph which indicates that he must have read not only Homer and Virgil, but also St. Augustine. The epigraph comes from uh, Book 19 of City of God, from the same basic context from which uh, I read you that passage at the start, uh, in which Augustine writes, anyone who looks with anguish on evils so great must acknowledge the tragedy of it all, and if anyone experiences them without anguish, his condition is even more tragic, since he remains serene by losing his humanity. So we should be clear again, Augustine did not think that force should never be used, or wars never fought, Men make war for the sake of peace, uh, he says in that same context. They use force because sometimes justice requires it, but they have to be careful lest they lose their humanity in doing so, lest they become mere things. Rightly understood, the requirements of justice exist to make war thinkable and a human undertaking, to remind us that power must be controlled by moral purpose, however hard that is if you're at all persuaded by, uh, by Simone Weil. And, and ironically, we are most likely to exercise this kind of moral control if we do not suppose that we can easily master or possess the technical capacities that are our own, that are our own invention. Paul Ramsey once wrote, war first became total in the minds of men. In the minds of men. Not in the weapons that they produced. He, he meant that total war being possessed by force in a way that makes us pure momentum, um, knowing no limits to our aims, that that's not simply the result of technology. It's the result of supposing always falsely that everything is within our power. Um, uh, we stand uh, today at a time when all sorts of particular questions, the sorts of things that I mentioned at the start, um, are, uh, are being rethought again, often to good ends. Uh, what does just cause mean in war? What's the nature of permissible preemption? Uh, what are the possibilities of humanitarian intervention? What the meaning of precision weapons? All sorts of uh, things. Um, that's the work of just war thinking, which is never, uh, never static. It changes and it adapts as circumstances require. But we sometimes imagine that the purpose of all that thinking is to help us identify, after the fact, guilty parties and punish them, as if we should all be judges at Nuremberg uh, or uh, uh, something like that. And no doubt, uh, this thinking may sometimes help with that task. But more important, I think, is the instruction it provides us as we try to think in advance about the dangers and temptations that we may face, um, that the world of force draws us into. We are tempted to, to suppose, as Vey suggests, that force creates its own moral world and that we must just conform to it or opt out of global responsibilities. We're tempted to suppose that everything is within our power. How we find our way through those temptations will determine, in some measure, uh, our character and the character of any American empire that, uh, that may exist. Returning, so, so returning to sword and shield alone, to Homer's world or Virgil's world, would not deliver us from the world of force, as even the most casual reader of Vey's essay should realize. For in any world it is possible to scorn the enemy, to miss the sense of equity that sets limits on how we pursue our aims. The fundamental problem is never the sword. It is the hand that wields it, the frail human spirit so easily overcome by fury rather than moved by piety. Recent discussions of the morality of war, especially Roman Catholic discussions, if you, sort of if you know any of that literature, have fostered the notion that just war thinking requires what, is, what has been called, frequently called a presumption against war. I don't think that's a very helpful way of putting the matter, though we understand why somebody might uh, say that. But a simple presumption against war would sometimes mean an unwillingness to seek justice and a willingness just to permit force to rule. Uh, what we need is not a presumption against war, but a presumption against injustice, which may sometimes require the use of force. But in the necessary but dangerous world of force into which that presumption against injustice draws us, we always have to pray for a willingness uh, to be freed from the enslaving power of force, a power that would make us all things, uh, even and perhaps especially in our transitory and fleeting moments of triumph. For as Simone Weil writes, a man cannot experience force without being touched by it to the very soul. Grace can prevent this touch from corrupting him, but it cannot spare him the wound. And it's in that sort of a world that one should always say with Augustine, deliver me from my necessities. Thank you very much.
questions? Who's calling on these people, you or me? Uh, why don't you I am, you? okay. Then you, 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 there you go. Okay. Um, given the political structure of our country, the United States, and the multifaceted political structure of the whole world, you know, uh, entities like the UN, you know, EU, and things like that, um, how do you think uh, going about thinking about and implementing these ideas about the use of force should be done with those within those structures? Are those structures harmful or helpful? To the, to the thinking about uh -huh. Well, um, in a sense, I'm not, I mean, I'm not quite sure how to uh, come to that question since in what, where, how else would you think about implementing them other than within the structures that you've got, even if you might yeah. be tempted to say those are the structures you're stuck with. Um, okay. Uh, they, they may not be that good uh, necessarily. Um, uh, the the uh, it's not clear now. You know, we must have different views in here, so I can only give, give you mine. But it's not clear that the United Nations is actually a very fruitful context in which to think about the use of force because it's hamstrung by the way the Security Council uh, operates. I mean, it's deliberately hamstrung, uh, and we may not we may not even want it unhamstrung um, uh, given some of the other possibilities, but. Um, uh, I'm not sure that uh, uh, it's that useful, and if, insofar as you agreed with that judgment, which you may or may not, but insofar as you agree with that, then you would think that um, uh, it is the responsibility of um, nation states, individual nation states, to uh, uh, think through the way, um, uh, the, the power that force has, the, what it means to uh, uh, wage war within limits, what uh, how one sustains those limits, what that means uh, for things like war aims, what that means for how you engage in military training, um, uh, you know, what, how, how do you teach a soldier to be a combat soldier. Um, uh, so that I, I, I still think we live in a world in which that has to be primarily the task of um, nation states. I don't actually think that there are overarching structures that are going to help very much with that. I'm not even sure it would be useful since I tend to think that a, uh, the worst thing in the world is one single force that nobody can resist. But that, you know, that gets us into some uh, other complicated questions. Now, I don't know, did I approach your question at all? Yes. <laughs> okay. You can come back to it if you want. Oh, yes. Well, in Christian terms, government is God's servant for your good, uh, uh, authorized uh, to use force. That doesn't tell us how one gets to be uh, the government, however. It just says that if you've got government, it's uh, God's servant uh, for your good. I don't think that there's uh, any single way that um, uh, governments come into existence. They don't have to be uh, democratically established to be uh, uh, legitimate governments. If they are um, uh, uh, carrying out some of the uh, most important functions that government provide and doing that uh, you know, if, uh, in, in ways that don't um, uh, tyrannize their own uh, subjects so that with some kind of consent, even if uh, what the political theorists call tacit uh, consent, um, that's good enough for me uh, as far as uh, figuring out what constitutes a, a legitimate government. There can, be, uh, there can be hard cases where you're not quite sure what you want to say. There can be cases where um, a uh, uh, people with a common history within a territory are so divided that one's not quite sure who really, who if any, uh, what structure if any uh, should be considered the legitimate government there. But in principle, um, uh, it's a matter of uh, effectively carrying out uh, uh, the 
basic functions that government is needed for, providing for a certain amount of justice and um, uh, doing it in relatively non-tyrannical ways. I mean, I mean, is that an answer to your question? Yeah, that's the question. Yes, way back there. Well, that, that's one of the $64,000 questions <laughs> that, um, uh, that continue to get debated. Um, in, in, the, in the history of the development of thinking about just war, let me just start there. You, I mean, you asked what I thought, but let me just start with the history of thinking of development about just war. Although these, these historical questions, are, are, there's not perfect agreement on them, but um, uh, originally, um, <coughs> Governments were supposed to pursue just cause, or, or, or to act with just cause, and um, uh, that that could mean even taking, even uh, be, being the aggressor, even striking first in order to accomplish uh, uh, good purposes that were needed. Gradually over time, um, uh, partly growing out of the development of nation states, but then also uh, influenced in some way by the develop weapons development in sort of mid 20th century on, uh, the view has grown up that uh, uh, governments should use force only for purposes of military defense, only to defend against an aggressor. Um, and, and if you think that way, there could be no such thing as a just aggressive war. Uh, and if you think that way, it's going to be very hard to uh, intervene in the affairs of another sovereign nation, even if um, there are some great evils there that perhaps could stand uh, to be uh, corrected. Um, Right now, I mean, there are big disagreements among people who think about it, about which way we should, uh, sort of which way we should go on those things. Um, my own view is that it's impossible, it's impossible for me to believe that, um, that there, there's no such thing as just aggressive war. I think there could be occasions on which uh, what we call humanitarian intervention, for instance, is, uh, is permissible. Uh, the harder question is whether it might sometimes be obligatory. That's, to me, that, see, I'm not actually, I'm not, some people are, and I understand the issue, but I'm not troubled by the notion that uh, 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 humanitarian intervention, um, when we're not threatened in any way, might be permissible to, to deal with some really uh, 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 terrible uh, event. But what I'm, what I'm really not sure about is whether it might be obligatory under certain circumstances, whether whether the, the rulers, the political leaders, uh, much, I don't much like the term rulers, uh, the, the political leaders of uh, uh, a country are entitled to ask the people whom they're there mainly to serve and protect to incur considerable risks simply for the sake of uh, uh, that kind of intervention. That it's permissible to do it is one thing, that they're required to do it I really don't know what I want to say about that. I mean, there's some, there's just some questions that we uh, we don't know what our mind is on it. I don't know what my mind is on that uh, question. But but I certainly don't think that the only legitimate war is sort of defense against aggression. I just think that the whole thinking of just war went went sort of wrong uh, uh, when we uh, when we thought that. So, in qualifying that, I'm not I'm not questioning um, that there are times in which we need to use force to uphold justice. Um, it's just like a, a huge tension that I feel, um, the sort of obligation to use force, and then Jesus's command to love. 
Did you hear him? Were you able to hear him back there? Okay. Um, well, you people like questions that have a long history. Uh, um, it, it's not a bad thing that you should, it seems to me it's not a bad thing that you should sense a tension there. Um, if you sense no tension there, you know, we probably would want you to think more about it uh, in a way. But um, uh, the, the, the history of the interpretation, for instance, of the hard sayings in the Sermon on the Mount is, you know, very complicated and never going to go away. Um, I can only um, uh, give you my read on it, and you can just decide whether you think it's uh, permissible or not. For, for starters, um, you know, when Jesus says that um, if somebody strikes you on the one cheek, you should turn to him the other, he doesn't say, he doesn't say that if somebody strikes him on the one cheek, I should walk over and turn his head so that they can strike him on the other also, okay? Um, uh, and and I, I, I may in fact, uh, I may in fact have an obligation to intervene on his behalf. Now, the way I read those passages to say that if you strike me, and it's really just me, it's just you and me, I'm supposed to be like Jesus. I, there's no guarantee that I will be, and you might, you might keep that in mind before you uh, strike me, but, but I'm supposed to be. And so if it's really just the two of us, then I should suffer rather than, you're the only other neighbor, you're the only neighbor there, and I should not uh, uh, retaliate against you in my own defense. But if there's more than one neighbor, uh, then, you see, my, uh, my responsibilities become much more uh, complicated. And um, for me to defend him against you is a very different thing from defending myself. And um, it may be that that's the way to enact the love that Christ requires, the neighbor, the neighbor love that Christ requires there. That's at least what I would, uh, I would argue. So now you, you, you can play a lot of games with this. Um, uh, and by the way, I have just given you, just so you know what you want to reject, if you want to reject it, uh, a kind of a standard Lutheran um, uh, reading uh, there. Uh, but not that, not that only Lutherans could believe this. Right thinking people of all sorts could, uh, <laughs> could think it. But, um, uh, you, you can play a lot of games with this. Uh, so that, for instance, I said, you know, it's just you and me here. Uh, but I reflect upon the fact that although they're not here, I have children who are dependent on me. Um, and although I would not strike back just to defend myself against you, I will retaliate uh, forcefully for their sake um, because they need to have me around yet. I mean, I can start playing all sorts of games with the language uh, if I want to, and because we always have more neighbors around. But at least in principle, I think there is a, there is there are circumstances in which um, uh, being Christ-like would mean um, uh, being like Jesus uh, as best we can. But there are a lot of other circumstances in which neighbor love uh, becomes more uh, more complicated, and we have to think it uh, think through our are several uh, responsibilities. Um, well, that is that, that, that's the best that uh, I can do for the moment. Obviously, there's more to say, but yes? Um, how do these ideas of the proper use of force uh, play into uh, enhanced interrogation methods? <laughs> those, <laughs> so sometimes those seem like a necessity. Um, where do, how, do, how do those kind of play into mm -hmm. just Oh, okay, that's a nice question. Um, in fact, Augustine's, the passage I quoted, Deliver Me From My Necessities, though of course it comes from a very different world uh, from ours, but Augustine's philosopher judge, as he describes him in book 19, chapter 6, The City of God, um, does use torture. And par par part, of the, part of the terrible tragedy of his circumstance is that he doesn't even know for sure if the torture will work, you know, and get the information he wants. Um, uh, so... Uh, well, again, you can, uh, you're going to get my view uh, on this, okay? Um, in general, I think we should say that uh, uh, torture is ruled out. Um, we have to say a couple things. So first, we have, we have to be clear on what torture, what is and is not torture, and I think 
you know, there are different views on that. I don't myself think forcing you to listen to loud music for 24 hours a day constitutes torture. It's not pleasant, uh, but I don't think it, it, unless it's, you know, Charles Wesley's hymns or something like that. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but it doesn't constitute uh, uh, torture. Um, uh, well, I like Charles Wesley's hymns a lot um, uh, myself. Um, uh, so, so, I mean, I, th I think sometimes our disagreements are simply about whether someone is being tortured or not. But, and, 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 and torture is also not even just hurting somebody. Um, you can, uh, you can, I don't think uh, slapping somebody around necessarily qualifies as torture. May not succeed either, but I don't think necessarily qualifies as torture. What torture really does is it is is it what's dehumanizing about it is that it it um, uh, attempts entirely to bypass the will of the other person. It tries to to compel him entirely against his will. Whereas I might try to force you in a lot of other ways. I mean, when I slap you around, I'm not bypassing your will, I'm trying to kind of compel your will in a way, but to entirely bypass the will, uh, 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 attempt to bypass the will of the other person. That's what's really terrible about torture. And so it's not just that it hurts the other person, it's that it, it doesn't treat him as a human being, uh, really. Um, that is the sort of thing that I, 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 I want to say in principle should never be done, okay? Whatever, whatever exact deeds we decide qualify for that. Now you can come up, I mean, people like the, you know, bomb in Times Square scenario and you've got 20 minutes to find out where it is uh, sort of thing and so forth. Um, uh, what I want to say about that sort of thing is that um, I don't know for sure uh, what I think uh, I would do in such a circumstance. Um, the one thing that's clear to me is that you, I don't think you should you should um, formulate a, a, a rule, a principle in advance that says it's okay if there's a bomb in Times Square and you've only got 20 minutes, it's okay to torture. Um, I, I don't think uh, I do that. If it's really, if, if, the, if what's gonna happen is so terrible that it just seems morally necessary to try to get this information and just strategically there doesn't seem to be any other way to get it, well then I don't know for sure. Uh, what I'd say. I just know I don't want a principle that says it's okay in advance. Um, and if you, if you do it under those circumstances, um, then I think you sort of got to take responsibility for it afterwards. I'm, I'm, I'm very reluctant just to call it the right act. Uh, you know, you can get yourself into some real moral muddles here. See, if you say it's necessary to do, but my lander, but you're not willing to say it's the right act. Um, you really got to have a robust Lutheran conscience uh, at that moment. Um, but um, uh, that's actually what, what I incline toward um, uh, along the way. So we ought to, we ought to, I mean, we ought to, on the whole, reject enhanced interrogation, not spend a lot of time dreaming up weird scenarios in which it, you know, might be necessary. But if, if you turn out to face one, well, then you, you can pray, deliver me from my necessities and figure out what to do at that point. I do think, see, the, one, one of the things, one of the ways in which I think I'm Augustinian is that I, I do think there might be, that we live in a world in which we might actually face circumstances in which you can't actually find a right act to do. I think the world's that disordered. Now, if you get a good Thomist here, like a few of them you had in this series, um, uh, they won't agree with that. Um, uh, uh, you won't get Jay Bujasevsky or Robert George to agree that the world is so disordered that you can't find a right act to do. And uh, you know, they may be right. Um, I'm just a little less confident. Yeah. Last question. Thanks. Um, can, I, can, I, can I just put you in a scenario and ask, what, I, I, I keep thinking about this, that last war memoir you read from. And I'm thinking about, um, I mean, your calls for moral deliberation at the interval seem entirely right and laudatory. I've never been in war, but I've heard enough about war to, I mean, it's, what's striking to me is, is you're saying there's, a, there's certainly a place for force, but we need to not become people who are people of fury. And here's a guy who does just what we would hope he would do uh, in terms of his own moral self-reflection, and he leaves. So 
I guess I'm wondering about people who enter into places where they'll be agents of force. Um, the, the, the scenario I'd love you to tell us what you'd say is, so let's say this is a room full of people who are just entering into that, and you want to give them a, a brief word of counsel about, you know, you know they're going to be purveyors of force necessarily. You want to caution them to, um, to not be taken up in fury, but they also need to steal themselves to do their job. What would you, maybe you wouldn't say much, I don't know. Oh, there must be people better qualified to advise them uh, than I. Um, well, um, I, th I think I'd want to tell them that um, uh, we're trying to train them to be uh, powerful agents, um, and I hope they really will be powerful because I'm behind them, and you know, um, I uh, they're my uh, they're in front of me, and I want them to uh, to be powerful. I, w I want them to um, uh, be, be forceful agents uh, uh, for justice, um, but that they will do that best if they remember what a weak and fragile thing a human being is. Um, and that, uh, therefore, real power requires um, not just ca you know not castrating yourself of aspiration every day, but reminding yourself every day as best you can of um, uh, the weakness and the fragility of a human being. Now that said, um, uh, if they're going into combat. They're going to be given orders. They more or less, unless they absolutely know that they're being ordered to do something that uh, they're not supposed to do, uh, they need to follow those orders. Um, there's a wonderful line in Michael Walzer's book that I quoted before. He says, "The life of a re the life of a combat soldier is not a research assignment." Um, uh, you know, he, he he doesn't have time to read some books, um, uh, contemplate the thing, talk about it with people, and so forth. So I think I, to, to me, it's just uh, remembering. Um, uh, 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 the fragility of life and the, um, uh, the sense that uh, uh, we're not as powerful as we think uh, we are um, and that um, uh, uh, there, there is a kind of, to take base, there's a kind of transitoriness to this and, and therefore there's going to be all sorts of, I mean Nathaniel Fick wrote about the rush of uh, adrenaline in combat and uh, I'm sure that's true but one has to be um, uh, one has to be cautioned in advance uh, to beware uh, of that, but not to be so, not to beware so much that you get yourself killed, uh, you know. Um, uh, so I, I, how, how you do that, how you do those things simultaneously, I don't know, but that's the, that's the trick. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.